Heavenly Father, we thank you that we come in this evening as a people who are just confident that despite our sin, despite our, our, our lustful intentions, Lord God, that you have covered us in the blood of Jesus and that you love us. This is, this is just a scandalous news, Lord God, that you love rebel sinners like me and like those sitting in front of me this evening. Father, we are once again amazed by your grace. We're amazed by the, just the breadth and depth of your love, your arms that reach underneath us when we are at our lowest ebb to haul us out of the miry clay and to set us on solid rock. Father God, we, we pray that tonight you would set your people on solid rock, solid ground, on, on footing that is firm for this week, so that as we go out, we would go out boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, not shamed, not beaten up, not uh, oppressed, but simply convicted by your goodness and grace and your, your, your forgiveness, the justification that you have made possible in Jesus. Lord, this evening we ask that you would help us to worship you aright and to do that in spirit and truth. We pray it in your name. Amen. Amen. Um, look, let me just, as it's here. Okay, Christmas buffet for caring for life. It's all on there. It's all on there. I can't see it. There's a big one at the back, isn't there, Margaret? <laughs> 9th of December at Friends House, that's John and Angela's house, Skull Common, for an evening fellowship and Christmas buffet at 7 o'clock, followed by carols, £10 per person. That's um, coming up, so sign up for that. See uh, Margaret if you need more. Do we need to say anything about the, or the Christmas tea that we were talking about this morning, or is that going to come? Right, we're going to sing. Uh, we're going to sing two songs, and um, I, I don't think I know the first one. So, Susan, you're on your own here. Um, so, stand up, and then we're going to. And I, and I don't know that we've sung the second one at this before, but I do know that, so I'll sing with you. We'll, we'll you and me will be fine. All right, let's stand up and sing these two songs together. Let's turn to the scriptures, shall we? Um, we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 this evening. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Um, I've told Trevor we're going to be reading verses 3 to 5, but actually, Trevor, we'll go from verses 1 to 6, if that's uh, okay <coughs> for the screen. So uh, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1. I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away, I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. <coughs> Let's just pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for an opportunity once again to come uh, around your word. And as we look into your word now, we do ask that you would uh, reveal to us perhaps things that are uh, new, not new from a novelty perspective or from an ideas perspective, but just new in that they would be fresh to us this evening. And uh, we pray, Lord God, that you would help us and aid us that we might uh, leave this place confident this evening that Jesus reigns and that uh, he is indeed on the throne, uh, the throne of our lives, not just uh, amazingly the throne of governing the universe, but that you, Lord, have your way 
would have your way in our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Uh, Amen. So um, let's just spend a bit of time looking into this passage this this evening, Um, kind of as a a follow-on from what we were talking about this morning in Matthew chapter 5, 27 to 30. Um, I had a little bit to say uh, on this passage this morning, time didn't allow that, and so I've kind of just developed that into a a, a talk of its own, um, uh, just as the day has has kind of gone on. Um, So it has to do with that lustful intent that we were thinking about this morning, but not exclusively, so I'm going to spare you the the, the 18 certificate this evening, Um, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of apply this to the to the passage but it does help us to think as we come into this just to to remind ourselves uh, of uh, the kind of basic um, premise that Jesus had in mind when he um, when he was talking on on the mountainside all those years ago lustful intent is about what we see with our eyes filter in the mind and desire in our heart Okay, so it's about seeing, f- seeing, filtering, desiring. And, and what do we do with what we see? Do we act on it or do we fight against it? And the point was that when it comes to sin, the urgency, there's this great urgency to fight, to fight, to fight. So I want to <clears throat> see if there's any um, computer nerds or, or geeks in, in the congregation. Does anybody know what uh, GIGO means? Anyone come across GIGO? G-I-G-O? Or, or Ryro, you might have heard it if you if you want to act. No, no, okay. Trevor, no. I, you know, I was going to look. I was just about to look. Garbage in, garbage out. Or anglicised rubbish in, rubbish out. Ryro, Gigo, uh, one of the. Look, here's what it says on. Um, here's what it says on Wikipedia about Gigo. In computer science, garbage in, garbage out is the concept. Hear this: the concept that flawed or nonsense garbage input data produces nonsense output. Uh, rubbish in, rubbish out is an alternative wording. Okay, so there's this idea that if you put in something, an, a concept or an idea that is flawed or nonsense, if that goes in, what you're going to get out will also be flawed or nonsensical. Garbage in, garbage out. Kind of sums up and explains why the world is like it is a little bit today, because it's sucking in garbage and it's putting out garbage. Proverbs uh, 15, 14. There's going to be a lot of scriptures tonight, so I told Trevor not to even try and bother keeping up um, on, on the screen. Um, he might do that, but um, Proverbs 15, 14. The heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouths of fools feed on folly. Okay, so hearts and mind. We're going to sort of heart and mind look at that synonymously, although I've separated them out in my eyes, mind and heart um, thesis, if you like. Um, the idea is, is heart and mind internalizing stuff, isn't it? The heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouths of fools feed on folly. So you've got, you've got what's going in and what's coming out there. So if we put good stuff into our mind, truth, truth will set us free, then we're going to get good stuff coming out. But if we, if, if only garbage is going in, that what comes out of our mouth is going to be folly. That's what uh, that's what's going on, on here. Look, let's just. I've got three uh, little passages. Let's get some interaction. Does somebody just want to read Deuteronomy chapter twenty-eight, verse twenty, for me? Just um, somebody read that twenty-eight twenty Deuteronomy twenty-eight twenty. Don't be polite. Just shout. I've got the right verse there. You've read it in a completely different language to one I was in. Yeah. Can I, I'm going to read that in the ESV. Thanks, Carl, for your authorised version. <sighs> Do you want to read? Oh, it's brother. No, read it. In verse, no, read it. If I give you the right verse, that would then help, wouldn't it? No. 28, 28, actually. I gave you the wrong one. Try verse 28. That is, it, it's in detail. We can find something. Go on. 28. This will work. The Lord shall smite thee with madness Oh, you've got heart, I've got mind. Now I'm getting that echo back. We're okay, we're good. We're no, okay. So there you go, that's better. So ESV, the Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind, okay? 
So this is God doing something to those who are disobedient, those who are just putting garbage into their minds. He will confuse your mind. So our, our minds without God are, are confused minds. Right, let's see if we can, let's see if I'm going to get this better this time. Somebody read Job chapter 17, verses 3 to 4. I'll look it up as well, make sure I've got the written the right verse. Job 17, 3 to 4. Don't be polite, just shout it out. Yeah, thank you, uh, Maureen. That's, that's exactly right. So Job is, is talking about his, uh, his useless counsellors, those who've been trying to help him, his, his worthless friends, if you like. And he talks about God having closed their minds. Again, they're just spouting out garbage most of the time, aren't they? It's this sort of false pseudo-wisdom that's coming out. Um, so their minds are closed. They've got confused minds. You've got closed minds. And uh, one more, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Uh, so, yeah, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 21 to 23. What does that say about the mind? Somebody read that. Yeah, just read it out. 221 to 22. You. Yeah, so it, it, it's anxious. you've got toil and anxious striving in the ESV. It's the toil and striving of the heart, or the mind. Yeah, so we, we just, it's, that's the whole premise of Ecclesiastes, isn't it? isn't it? We just work so hard, and for what? Without God, without bringing God into it, our minds are, are restless and anxious. So what you put in is what you're getting out. Confusion, closed, restless minds, okay? So let's come back to this, uh, this passage then. So I want to focus on uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. Look, the context here is that the Apostle Paul is having to deal with um, false apostles who are coming up against him and basically spouting out allegations that he's really not who he says he is. Um, they've come from Corinth and they are flat out opposing the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And so what he's doing here in chapter 10, indeed what much of chapter 2 is, is, is about and where he's leading to at the end of this, having to deal with this quite severely, is he's being forced to defend his, his apostleship, the genuineness of his calling as an apostle. He says this in verse 3, Though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. Though we uh, uh, walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. Now, we've done a bit of work on flesh, haven't we, in, in Philippians over the last couple of weeks, the mutilators of the flesh. We were looking at those, weren't we, uh, a few weeks ago in Philippians uh, chapter 3. Here's this idea again of flesh, a, a constant theme of Paul's coming up. <clears throat> Effectively, what he's saying there is, look, we don't live according to worldly standards of life. But we, we, we live according to spiritual power. We live in a spiritual reality. We don't dwell in the, the reality that men and women just without the Holy Spirit dwell in. We don't just dwell in fleshiness, in, in mere humanity. We, we view life through the lens of Scripture with the power of the spirit. It's spiritual power and spiritual reality. So Paul is saying, I'm not going to come up against people who are cleverer than I am or claim to be cleverer than I am. And I'm not going to try and fight them in the flesh. I'm confident in God. I'm confident in who God has made me to be. And his calling is enough for me. I will stand up to anything, any scrutiny in, in, in my ministry insofar as I am preaching Christ Jesus. Though we walk in the flesh, we're not waging war according to the flesh. Now, that is helpful, actually, in, in, a, in our understanding of that shocking, horrific passage that Jesus uh, spoke in verse 29 of Matthew 5. You know, if your, eye, your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. 
and again, I mentioned this this morning, it, it's horrific, particularly in this context. We've done, um, you know, Ian and, and Celia uh, have run um, courses with young people, um, something like the Soul Course, or, 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 which is Christianity Explored for Young People. And these kind of verses come up. And, you know, I don't know if they remember, but I, I can remember when we've had uh, unchurched young people coming in, them saying, uh, hearing this language of Jesus and actually getting quite upset of the idea that Jesus seems to be suggesting that we should self-harm. Um, and and it, it opens up a lot of issues, a lot of pastoral issues uh, with, with some of these kids. Um, no, Jesus isn't suggesting that we self-harm. What he's saying is it's pointless trying to battle the flesh with, with flesh. You need something bigger. You need something infinitely more profound. Because at the end of the day, our flesh isn't the problem. Now, you might think that's surprising because Paul is saying our flesh is the problem. So hear me through here. Our flesh isn't the problem. Uh, how we fight with it or give into it, the flesh is a symptom of a bigger problem. It's the problem of what's going in, on in our minds and in our hearts. So yes, what we do with our flesh is a problem. Of course it is. It's the fleshy nature that has been put off and the spiritual nature that has been put on in new creation. But the, the reason we use our hands and we look at things with our eyes externally is because of a battle that's going on in our minds, because our minds are broken. They're broken by sin, cursed by the fall. So Jesus isn't literally saying, chop off your, your arm, gouge out your eye. I mean, if he was, it would be rather silly if it was literal, because if I gouge out my right eye, well, I've still got my left eye. If I, gouge, if I chop off my right hand, I've still got my, my left hand. And frankly, if you're struggling with uh, lustful intent, there's probably slightly more obvious things that you could chop off, isn't there? So, even if I gouge out both my eyes, stop both of my ears and chop off both of my hands, I've still got 47 years worth of pictures and imagery in my mind to chew on and to sin over. It's not about my hands and my eyes, it's about the battle for my mind. I, you, can, you can chop every bit of my body off and leave all the functioning organs and I, I've still got my mind to contend with. So it's pointless taking the war to the flesh or fighting flesh with flesh because as it says there in verse 4, the weapon of our warfare, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. So what Paul is getting to is we've got to deal with what's in your head. We've got to deal with what's in your heart. So, look, let me throw some more scriptures at you to illustrate this. <clears throat> I'll, I'll read these ones out. Because there's a few of them. 1 Timothy 6, 5. Paul writing to Timothy says in 1 Timothy 6, 5, there is constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. Romans 8, verse 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh, the mind, see the difference there between the mind and the flesh, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. We'll check out 2 Corinthians 3.14. For their minds, we're talking about the, the mind of the Jews, whose, whose, whose eyes are veiled to the truth, yeah? Their minds <coughs> are hardened. Or we'll flip over to 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, if, you're looking, if you're keeping up with me. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And then back to uh, Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 8. Just as Janus and Jambres oppose Moses, so these men also oppose the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith so all of these paul passages he talks about a depraved mind a mind that's hostile a hard mind blinded minds and minds that are corrupt okay that's that's the picture of the mind that that is that is painted for us now did you also notice in those verses there's a ton of others you could go to if you if you, if you check it out yourself later on the link between the mind and truth garbage in garbage out Okay, so <clears throat> again, let's just go through them. So in 1 Timothy 6, 5, um, the, the mind is depraved because it's deprived of truth. 
So depraved mind deprived of truth. Yeah. Uh, Romans eight seven. Um, the mind that is hostile is the mind is hostile to God because it does not submit to God's law. God's law is truth. Your word is truth. So my mind is hostile because I'm not submitting to the truth. Two Corinthians three four. Their minds are hardened because the truth is veiled from them. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, uh, their minds are blinded um, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, which is the truth, isn't it? Uh, 2 Timothy 3.8, their minds are corrupted because they, what, quote, oppose the truth. So you've got the truth of God's word in your hand, and the extent to which you, you, you believe that, do you, the extent to which you abide in it, the extent to which it's imparted into your heart is the extent to which you are dwelling in truth and the extent to which you will dwell in truth as we go through the course of this week. So there's mind and there's truth. Am I believing the truth and therefore using my right hand and my right eye in a godly way or am I going to be hostile, depraved, closed, hard, corrupted, uh, to all of that and therefore use my eye and my, my hand in a way that is not God honouring. It's a battle. We're in this battle. It's, it's good to be able to grasp our culture. So this morning I talked about how we are living in a, a, a liberal, secular, atheistic culture. It's good to understand something of what that means. But if you don't, don't worry. What you need to understand is the truth. Truth is more important than a deconstruction of, 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 of the culture that is around us. So w what do we have at our disposal then if we don't fight flesh according to flesh? Well, um, here, here's what, what it goes on to say. The weapons, verse 4, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. This is such a deadly battle. We need divine power. We need spiritual weapons to win in this battle. We need spiritual weapons if we are to succeed, if we are to, to win the fight. So he talks there about <clears throat> uh, the weapons of our warfare are not the, of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy hot strongholds. If you have a, an ESV cross-reference Bible, you might see a cross-reference there to uh, the end of this uh, letter, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and we get a definition of divine power. This is 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse 3 and following. I'll read that to you. And Paul is still dealing with false, false stuff that's coming in. Since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. So this divine power that we have is God. We have, we have the very weapons of heaven at our disposal. We have the power of God himself, the triune blessing, the triune strength, Father, Son, and Spirit that we can call upon to help us fight when our eyes see things that our mind then filters and our hearts decide to act on. Jesus prayed, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's one thing to pray that prayer. It's another thing to know how to do it. Well, good news, we, we're going to be on to the prayer in, well, it'll be the other side of Christmas, but we, it won't be long. We'll learn what Jesus means and how to pray the Lord's Prayer. But deliver me from these things. It's, it's a mind thing, but it's not mind over matter. It's not kind of mind games. It's not me kind of having to dig deep into my subconscious. It's simply saying, God, help me. God, help me. We'll look at that again just before we finish the, the message uh, this, this evening. So divine power to destroy strongholds. What are these strongholds? Well, these are spiritual strongholds. And I would, I would submit to you that these strongholds can be summed up as Satan's lies. They're the lies of Satan that say to you, you know what, you can't really trust God's word. And, and, and it's Satan goes on and says, you can't trust God's word, I can offer you something that is much better. Did God really say 
Eve, you will not sure, you will not die. Right, let, me, let me show you a better way. These, these are strongholds. Now, I've heard this passage preached on before, and the preacher, I think, has he's made a, a, a good point, but it's been applied. The, 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 the stronghold has been made synonymous with addiction. And he said, these are the things that we're addicted to. I, I, I don't think that's doing this passage justice. I don't think strongholds are the ad- things that we're addicted to. Again, this is, this is about what's going on in our heads. Now, this is much, much more powerful than drug addiction or alcohol addiction or gambling addiction or an addiction to career success or an addiction to a nice motor vehicle or something like that. This, these are strongholds. These are the demonic powers that lie behind the addiction. And the addiction may not necessarily be substance abuse or uh, addiction to, to money or, or fame or, 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 or any of these, these things, lustful intent. Generally speaking, actually, the stronghold is just the fact that naturally speaking, fleshly speaking, we are addicted to not believing the truth of God's word. That's our natural bent, isn't it? Our minds are broken because we we have this stronghold, it's called sin, it's the curse in our mind that said you, you can't really trust God's word, you might as well go and do it your way and you know, be, be your own mini-god. Follow your dreams, follow your idols, do what's right for you, be true to yourself. Because, and that's the stronghold. It's just living against or not according to the truth of God's word. It's, it's demonic. It's demonic stuff. It's anti-Christ. It's what we do whenever we set ourselves up individually against God and say actually God thanks you can get off the throne of my life and I'll sit on the throne of my life I've got bigger and better things to worship as far as I'm concerned and ultimately the bigger and better things that I worship are going to be me you know because I'm on the throne of of my life so these are demonic strongholds and Satan is cunning and he dresses these things up in different ways so Paul well Paul exposes them he he describes these strongholds in verse 5 um, as arguments and lofty opinions. Did you see, do you see that? might be something different in your version. I, I haven't checked it out in other versions, but in the ESV, it's, it's uh, arguments and lofty opinions. And so Satan disguises arguments and lofty opinions in a number of ways. Anything that, and these are anything that are, are, are against the knowledge of God, the truth. So I'll give you three First of all, worldviews. Yeah, so they're described as, they're, they're d- dressed up as atheism, secularism, Darwinism, relativism. All of these worldviews are arguments and lofty opinions set up by Satan against the, against the truth, against the knowledge of God. So worldviews, secondly, perhaps more, more subjectively, are mindsets. Okay, when your mind tells you you should be fearful and troubled and anxious. When your mind tells you that this is going to be a bad week, this is going to be, and, and, and fear, anxiety, worry, and depression set in. These, these can become strongholds, okay? It's the, it's the mental health outbreak, which is very real and very powerful. But these are, these are strongholds. These are consequences of sin, Satan, and curse. And our minds set up arguments and lofty opinions against the knowledge of God. Worldviews, mindsets, the third one, are, are, are idols. What, what are your idols? What's on the throne of your life? Lustful intent, perhaps, success, money, fame, position, any of these things are all arguments and lofty opinions against the knowledge of God. So when you hear worldviews, mindsets, idolatry, it's just words that... Paul exposes in verse 5 uh, to describe arguments and lofty opinions. But here's the good news. Here's the good news. We saw already in verse 4 we have divine power to destroy strongholds. We have divine power as Christians to, look at verse 5, destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought to obey Christ. We have divine power to destroy strongholds. We have divine power to take such strongholds 
captive. So um, to take captive, that just means that you have in Christ the ability to control, conquer, submit these things to obedience to Christ. You've got that power at your disposal, as it is in God's word. The strongholds, the arguments, the lofty opinions, all these things are the domain of Satan. They are all part of his fake offer of salvation, which, by the way, is no salvation at all. Yeah, the things that Satan charms us with, the things he whispers in our ear to say, this, come this way, walk, walk with me, walk with me, do not lead to life and salvation. They lead to death and destruction, don't they? That's why Jesus says so graphically, cut out your eye and chop off your arm. It's better to do that than face hell. Stop sinning. Sort out your mind. Take these things captive. You know what? Satan is absolutely fine that you bunch are in church this evening. He's happy with that. He's got no problem that you were here this morning as well. He, he's quite settled in the fact that Christians are in church on a Sunday. But I, he says, I'm out to get you on Monday. Good, well done. Round of applause. Go you Pharisees for not murdering anyone today or committing adultery. Go you churchgoers for being here. Satan's happy with that but you wait till Monday morning. <laughs> Boom. Boom. Your eyes are open. Your mind is filtering and your heart is making decisions all the time. Shall I follow Christ or shall I follow Satan? So you have to fight. You have to fight. How, how do you fight? Let me throw another verse at you. Um, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 26. So back to the first letter. I'll start at verse 24, and we'll read to the end of 27, but 26 is the key one I want to get here. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises, here we are, self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So, I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. You have to fight. And you actually have to fight a real enemy. Paul is saying here, there's no point just shadow boxing, you know? There's no point just punching the air. There's no point just, you know pointing your fingers and wagging and, and flaying aimlessly around. There's no point getting on a running track and running a race if you're not going to go anywhere. You've got to fight what is in your mind. You've got to fight what Satan has put in before you. You've got to fight and, you, and knowing that you have divine power to fight. You might wake up tomorrow morning. Maybe you're going to go to bed tonight just feeling wretched and weak and, and, and hopeless. Friends, we need to do what the psalmist did time after time we need to preach scripture to ourselves why are you downcast oh my soul why are you downcast oh my soul trust in god preach it brother preach it to yourself know it that you can preach it to yourself so that when your eyes see and your mind filters the desire of your heart is only ever heavenward bent you see, when it comes to the things we were talking of this morning, or any other sin come to that, what Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians 9, 26, I don't run aimlessly, I don't box as one beating the air. I think what he's saying here is, you know, repent of your sin, don't try and manage it. How many of us as Christians, we think we've repented of our sin, but actually what we're doing is managing our sin? Do you see the difference? Oh, turn your phone off, I'm sure. Do you see the difference? You know, I say, okay, it's okay, look, no one's going to, I'm going to do it at such a time of night that no one's, my wife won't find out. Okay, I'm not hurting anyone. Um, I'm going to, I'm, you know, I'm just, just sorting this arrangement that isn't, isn't quite to, meant to be on the record out. 
I know I shouldn't. And, and we think, and we'll come at the end of the day and we'll, we'll maybe pray a prayer say, sorry God, sorry for that. And we're back to, and we're managing. We're managing, we're shadow boxing. Paul says, don't do that. Repent of your sin, don't manage your sin. Get rid of it, cut it out, chop it off. It's got to go. It's got to go. So two little application points, because I can throw as much scripture at you as you like. You know, it's like, well, will you be doing it on tomorrow morning? I don't know. That's down to between you and the Lord and the divine power that you have. So look, I'm just throwing scripture at you. What you do with it is between you and the Lord. Go home, let it sink in and plant it in your soul. Abide in it. The truth will set you free. Look, let's go. We, we go here so often, don't we? Philippians chapter 4. I mean, it's almost obvious. Um, can't you find a, you know, something in the Old Testament to kind of apply? No, it's just, it's just too good, isn't it? So uh, 1 Corinthians 4. Here's the, 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 the prescription list, if you like, for how we deal with our mind. Paul writes, and again, this comes after severe disagreement between two women in the church, doesn't it? Did I say, what have I said? Philippians, yeah, Philippians chapter 4. Yeah, it's all right. We, oh, well, thank you, I do that every time. My wife will say to me, Jonathan, you said, you said that and you meant that. You need to do that more often, just let me know. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. So what's going on in your mind? You might be absolutely ensnared and entrapped with it in a horrible disagreement like you Eudia and Syntyche were. Paul says this, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Well, how do I do that? Number one, let your reasonableness be known to everybody. The Lord is at hand. So number one, be reasonable because Jesus is close. Or be reasonable because he's coming again soon. He's at hand. He's near. Number six, verse six, do not be anxious about anything. Well, that's, it's easy to say, isn't it? But I've got a week, you do not know the week I've got coming up this week. I am pretty anxious. Well, okay, don't be anxious, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. We just want to get to verse seven, don't we? We don't want to do the hard work, being reasonable, um, knowing Jesus is near, you know, not being anxious, but praying. We, but, this, but we do that. Look, what is, the promise is in verse 7. And the peace of God, which, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. All this talk of fighting, all this talk of battling and punching and boxing a real, a real enemy. Paul just says it simply here. He just says, quite, pray about it. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? And I've forgotten the rest, but you know it. Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Go home tonight. You don't literally have to go home and set up a boxing ring and put the ropes around it and call in Paul Harvey to be the, be the referee and, and, and get in the ring and start fighting. You simply need to pray and abide in the truth and preach like the psalmist did to yourself. The, the peace of God, the angels of God will, will, will form the ring around your mind and your heart to enable you to know life in Christ this week. We miss this, don't we? Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Why? Because we don't carry everything to God in prayer. I don't know when I'm going to learn that lesson. I'm still learning it. We're learning it together, aren't we? Finally, be, be convicted by the truth. Recognize the difference between an argument and a conviction. Okay, so three more little scriptures for you. Um, big scriptures. Little, little passages, but big, big passages. One I read to you this uh, morning, and one that we know well. Romans 8, verse 39, listen to this. Um, verse 37 to 39. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a conviction, not an argument. 
If you look at that and think, actually, that's there for me to argue with and to, to deconstruct and to, you know, no, 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 it's, it's for you to be convicted by. It's truth. Um, go into the, I'll give you one from the Old, uh, the Old Testament. How about this one? Again, uh, familiar verses, Isaiah 40, verses 28 to 31. Isaiah 40, 28. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not, fa- grow, he does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power, divine power, but power here. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths grow faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Oh, if you are battling with lustful intent or whatever it may be, no, even young men stumble and fall and youths grow tired and weary. Don't argue with this. Be convicted by the fact. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. It's there for you to be convicted by, not for you to argue with. It's truth. And then one more, and then I'm done. This time in the letter of Jude and the doxology at the end. Jude, verse 24 and 25. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only god our savior through jesus christ our lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before all time and now and forever amen don't don't argue with jude uh, jude here is is jesus able to keep you from stumbling in the first place even young men stumble and fall can he stop you from letting what go, goes into your mind and is filtered into your eyes and is filtered by your mind and then worked out in your heart. Can he stop you from stumbling? You bet you he can. To the extent that he can present you blameless, you murderers, you anger problem people, you lustful intent saturated adulterers. Can he present you blame? You bet he can. Of course he can. Don't, don't argue with This isn't an argument or a lofty opinion. This is the truth of Scripture for you and I to be convicted by. Heavenly Father, we love your word. And Lord, on the one hand, it, these things are, are, they are so, to fight in a battle is, is messy. It's never clean. It's, it's hard and it's wearisome. And Lord, many of us are fighting daily, maybe moment by moment, all the time, with demonic strongholds. We might not see them as demonic strongholds. We might just think, oh, it's just these little things that are going on in my head uh, and, and these little things that I'm doing. Father God, help us to recognize what they are and to take them captive and to be convicted by Scripture. And to remember that what Satan is offering us, however beautiful and extraordinary and wow it looks and feels and tastes, it's nothing compared to Jesus. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. Give us clean hands and pure hearts to follow you this week with eyes that look to Jesus in your word. And Lord, help us not to feel ashamed when we don't do that. Even youths grow tired and weary. Uh, old, men grow tired, old men grow tired and youths stumble and fall. We, we, we all are all prone here, but he is able. He's able to keep us from stumbling. And we might be presented before the presence of his glory with great joy. So we thank you for the only God, our Saviour,
through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We thank you for the glory, majesty, dominion, and authority that is ours for all eternity. Lord God, we want to worship you. We love you. And we ask you to be near us, Lord Jesus, this week. Amen. I'm going to just sing a couple of uh, uh, songs.